following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. And with you as well. Hey, I'm left-handed. Really? But I'm not Canadian. Well, then I beat you. There you go. (laughs) If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. Uh, to the book of Acts, excuse me. Uh, Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to be at today. Uh, Last year, we started in the book of Acts, and uh, then we paused, and we had Thanksgiving, and we had Christmas, and now we are back in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to be at today. We're going chapter by chapter, week by week in the book of Acts, and you can pick up the rest of the reading in the week um, by yourself if you want to. Um, Acts chapter 11 verse 19 is where we're going to be at today, and we're going to look uh, all the way through to verse 30. If you don't have a Bible, um, the ones in front of you, feel free to grab and to use. Uh, Page 1711 is where you're going to be at. Acts is right after the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, we're going to look, like I said, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. I've been talking to a couple of people in regards to their New Year's resolutions. Raise your hand if you made a New Year's resolution this year. All right. Well, that's what's called when your sermon illustration falls flat on its face. Uh, I was going to ask you if you broke your New Year's resolutions, but never mind. There was like probably two of you that made New Year's resolutions. You're like, I'm not raising my hand. That ain't going to happen. Nobody else raised their hand. And that's fine. Um, Some people want to change the world. Some people don't. And uh, so, (laughs) all good. Uh, Some people do make New Year's resolutions, and and some people realize how quickly they fade away. And uh, I realize that people make resolutions because they want to leave their mark on society and the world. If you were to talk to anybody, they would look at you and they would say, of course, I want to leave my mark. I want people to remember me. I want people to remember me for a specific thing. Um, And it's important that we leave our mark. And what are we doing, essentially, to leave our mark? And Acts chapter 11 speaks to us in 2019 in really a very significant way. Um, As we see in Acts chapter 11, there is a catalyst change between the witnessing to the Jews moving into the Gentiles. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, it's very pivotal because we realize that Luke, our author in Acts, is going to meticulously outline how Gentiles come to know the Lord and how that has affected our church, that has affected our community. If the gospel was not to the Gentiles, you and I would still be in our sins. Very few people that we know are Jewish. But we realize we fall in that Gentile category. And in Acts chapter 11, here comes the push that the Gentiles are going to receive the gospel. It takes place in a town called Antioch, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. There are believers from Cyprus and Cyrene, which is modern day Libya. And what's happening here is we're seeing that Luke is articulating how large numbers of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Antioch is our motherland. As Gentiles, we realize in this passage of Scripture that it's the base of operation that from there, all the gospel will go out to the rest of the world. And it is in this place where people were first called Christians. And why were they called Christians? And what was so special about these people? And is these special people, or are these special people, uh, have similarities that we have? Can I be like people in the Bible? I ask myself that question all of the time. What we realize here is the answer is yes. We all have the opportunity to carry the gospel and to change the world and to shift the focus from that which is secular into that which is sacred. So Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to be at this morning. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing upon his word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth and how clear it is to us. And here we see in Acts how we can leave our mark on society. Here we see in Acts how we can be different. We can be a catalyst for change. Here we see in Acts how we can change the world. Both individually, but also corporately. 
as a church. We understand that we have responsibility when we come to know you as Lord and Savior. Our responsibility is to share the gospel, but our responsibility is also to build up the church, to evangelize, share the faith, and to edify too as well. And so God, this morning as we articulate this text, make it clear for those who are listening online, for those who are here in person, for those who will hear it later on. We pray that your son Jesus Christ would be made known both near and far. We long for you to come back again soon. And until that day, we will proclaim your word and your truth because it is truth. And we will cling to it. And as Proverbs says, we will lean on it. I believe that. Do you? Amen? <clears throat> okay. Uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Says this. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were coming to Antioch to the Hellenists. What in the world is a Hellenist? Also, they were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. First thing, four ways that we change the world. First thing that we see that happens. First thing that transpires here in the text is an invading of culture. If you're taking notes here this morning, write down the first way that you leave your mark, that you imprint society, is you have to invade culture. We don't just stand by and sit by and watch it pass us. We invade it. We go to culture. Now what's transpired here in the text? Well, Stephen, we know, has died. And because of Stephen's death, we realize that people are persecuted and they scatter. They go into other areas and locations and they settle in these faraway cities. Now the gospel at that time, the good news that Christ came, Christ died, and Christ rose again, is only for the Jews. People had just been ministering to the Jews. Why? Because the Jews are God's favorite people and God's favorite people get God's favorite message. Until now. Then the Gentiles get it because of what transpired with Peter. If you go back in the text in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 44, you'll read this, where it says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Why? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. Antioch, motherland, Gentiles are receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the believers in Antioch invaded culture and refused to sit by and be passive with their faith, we have received the truth of Jesus Christ. And so we too must not be passive with our faith. This is the expanse. Now why Antioch? Why would God use Antioch? Good question. Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It is a great sending center. It's the third largest city in the Roman Empire, about 500,000 people, so just a little bit bigger than Bremen. It was remodeled by Caesar Augustus, Tiberius, and Herod the Great. It was well watered, now check this out, horribly corrupt. Absolutely corrupt. You mean to tell me that the gospel comes from something that is corrupt? You mean to tell me that something good could come out of Nazareth? Jesus works in the corrupt places. There's pagan cults everywhere, sexual immorality everywhere, and other kinds of evil. And God works in the dark places. And so what we see here is that he's establishing himself to Jews and Gentiles in a gloomy culture. Is the same true about us today? Absolutely. We live in a world that is soaked with sin. And God doesn't often send light to places that are light. He sends light to places that are darkness so the darkness can be removed and the light can shine. You have an opportunity to be the light of Christ in a dark place. Whether that's your workplace or your home. Whether that's with your kids or whether that's uh, where you populate. We have some people in our church who are... Um, uh, have a, an issue right now with their parents being in poor health. And what they're finding themselves is they're in nursing homes. 
And what happens a lot of times in nursing homes is people walk right by people who are sick and need the gospel the most. And we don't stop in caring for the people that we need to care for the most to care for the people that are next to them. The gospel is for people who are in nursing homes. The gospel is people who are in high schools. The gospel is for people who are on factory floors. It is for the dark, gloomy places that you and I populate. Invade culture and you change the world. Antioch is going to change because of the gospel. And look at this in verse 20. They're going to receive some help from Cyprus and Cyrene. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to the dark places, I always say, God, I don't want to go alone. My kids are scared of the dark and they don't want to be there alone. That makes sense, right? So we see help comes from Cyprus and Cyrene. Notice how God helps send aid to the Hellenists. The Greek-speaking Jews, the Greek-speaking Gentiles. When these believers spoke, look what, the, look what the Bible says in verse 20. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Some of us are in dark places, and we need to pray the prayer, God, send somebody else to help minister in the work that needs to be done. Have you prayed that prayer in the dark places that you populate? Some like to dwell within the church, but C.T. Studd said, I want to run to rescue, I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Isaiah, for example, God is looking for people. And Isaiah said, he says, who will I send? And what does Isaiah say? Here I am, Lord, send me. The same is for you teachers who are in your schools. The same is for the students. The same is for those of you on the factory floor. The same is true for you who are CEOs or CFOs or CEOs or NFLs or whatever the place. You are called to go to dark places to be light for dark people. Here I am, God, send me. Isaiah says it, do you? Now here's the interesting thing. If we look at Antioch, it was a huge city, cosmopolitan, commercialized, and corrupt. Over half a million people, mostly pagan. Now here's the crazy thing that I see in the text. You would think that the believers would have been intimidated to walk into that city, yes? Not at all. They saw it as a challenge. They looked at that city and said, we'll go. We're going to invade this culture. And when we arrive, we have good news. What does a dark culture need? A dark culture needs good news. A dark culture needs good news. Do you have good news? Well, yeah, I have good news. Oftentimes, as believers, we are quick to condemn those people who are lost instead of quick to save them and show them the way, the truth, and the life. We invade that culture with the good news. And look what happens here. They call them Christians because of what they claimed. And it grew. Boldness, personal growth, church growth, spiritual growth, numerical growth. Now here's my question after I read this passage of scripture. What if they reject my message? Okay, Pastor Jordan, I'm going to go tomorrow and I'm going to start telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ in two ways. How I live my life, number one, and number two with my mouth. Because sharing our faith and evangelism is twofold. It is with who you are and how you act, and it is with what you say to other people. Okay, Pastor Jordan, I'm going to do that. I'm going to live like Jesus. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall short, but I'm going to do that. What if they reject me? Well, you would be in good company because Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 16, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me, but anyone ready for this who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. So you would be in good company. If they rejected Jesus, they reject you. And what is the attitude of the believers in the early church when they get rejected? Do you know? They go rejoicing. The Greek word there is skipping. Just kidding. They are delighted over the fact that we have the opportunity to be in the same circle as Jesus Christ who was rejected. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel that is in me. Are you ashamed of the gospel? 
Do you want to be accepted by man or rejected by God? It's a good question for 2019. I have to start to change the world by invading the culture. Now, passage continues. 22. <clears throat> the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem that many, this is the report, that many or a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And so they say, this is awkward. And they send Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas, you go. And when he came, he saw the grace of God and he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with a steadfast purpose. So if the first way that we change the world and change ourselves is to invade culture, the second would be to be like Barnabas. And if you could write that in your Bible, you could put that in the margins. I would like to be like Barnabas. But my question is, why did they send Barnabas? Why does the Jerusalem church send Barnabas? Well, Barnabas, Barnabas' name is son of encouragement. And as a son of encouragement, he was no stranger to these things. After all, he is the one who stuck up for Saul when everybody else thought it was a trap in Acts chapter 9, verse 27. So Barnabas is bold. Barnabas pulls no punches. Barnabas is two things. He is an encourager. Now, track with this. The Greek here for encouraging means to comfort or help or one of strong counsel. You know the piece of advice that you need, but you just don't want to hear it from somebody else? You ever gotten that? That's who Barnabas was. Let me shoot straight with you. Let me talk to you on a real level. It is the same word used about the Holy Spirit who is our counselor, who encourages us and spurs us on and pokes us and prods us and twists us and turns us. It's the one friend you need, but you don't want. That's Barnabas. He's the one person that you need most in your life, but you just don't want him. Oh, God, send somebody else. Oh, I'm going to send Barnabas. Dark times call for bright, bold people. Barnabas was an encourager who told the truth with a smile on his face the whole time. Did you know that you're going straight to hell? That just sounds a whole lot better than the other way, doesn't it? Did you know that you're just ruining your life one day at a time? I can handle that news if you put a smile on your face, right? Barnabas is an encourager, and he is a ray of sunshine. Do you know Winnie the Pooh? Winnie the Pooh has two characters, Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore. The rest of them I don't care about. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh is bright, and he's happy, and he's always got a positive outlook on life, doesn't he? And I think it's because he's roly-poly. <laughs> I do. He looks comfortable in his own fur. And Winnie the Pooh, he gets in all these situations and circumstances, and he says, oh, bother, no worries, as long as we have honey, we're going to be okay. And so he just kind of rolls through life. And then you have Eeyore. Eeyore's a downer. Eeyore's one of those, uh, I don't know what he is. He's a, a mule? Donkey, thank you. And, oh, well, I guess if we're going to do things that way, we might as well. Oh, boo-hoo, boo-boo-hoo. I don't know why Pooh keeps Eeyore around, but I wouldn't keep Eeyore around if I was Pooh. <laughs> and one of my favorite parts about Pooh, this is Pooh theology this morning, is there's a song in Winnie the Pooh where it says, I'm just a little black rain cloud. Pooh's excited that there's rain clouds in his life. What? And he, he understands this. Now, here's my question, and this is why I bring up Winnie the Pooh. Are you a ray of sunshine or a little black rain cloud? Are you a Winnie the Pooh in life or are you an Eeyore? And if you don't know, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. And there should be your resolution for 2019 right there. <laughs> Barnabas is an encourager. He does it with a smile on his face. Because he loves people and he loves the Lord and he wants what's best for them. And he does it in an encouraging way. He's not a Debbie Downer. He's not an Eeyore. Now look at what he says. Because Barnabas is like that, he spreads the spirit and the faith. Verse 24. He is a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. Full, like Stephen in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And because of his qualities, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. I would put in my Bible... God, help me to be a Barnabas. 
God, help me to be an encourager, to be filled with the spirit, to be strong in faith, to be bold, to minister joyfully with kindness, with a smile on my face. Help me to encourage while teaching the believers. Would people say that about you? When you walk into a room, are they excited to see you or do they loathe your existence? Is it because you have an outlook and the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ or is it just because life is what it is? I talked to Becky yesterday. She was, such, she was in such a good mood. I got off the phone with her. and I think it was yesterday. It might have been the day before that. It was Friday. And uh, I'm dragging. And... Um, I hung up the phone, and, and Bethany looked at me, and she said, Jordan, how's Becky doing? How's she feeling? And I said, she, she sounds good. She sounds good. With little black rain clouds over our head, we can still be good because we have God in our lives. If you want to change the world, you've got to be like Barnabas. If you want to change the world, you have to invade the culture. Let's continue. <clears throat> Verse 25. So Barnabas... After he realizes uh, that, and this is the second time, by the way, a great number who believe turned to the Lord. Invasion of culture causes that. Barnabas causes that. 25. So Barnabas goes to Tarsus. Who do we know from Tarsus? Saul. To look for Saul. And he found him. And he brought him to Antioch. He brings the most vile person from the church who came to a relationship with Jesus Christ over back to Antioch. If you've been saved from a dark place, you have the ability to put light in the same dark place. So many times what God saves us from is what God puts us back to so that we can save somebody else as well. So oftentimes we get to the point and place in our life where we go, God, I want nothing to do with that world ever again. And he says, don't tell me what to do. Because I have plans for you, declares the Lord. So he pulls Saul and he says, I want you to come back with me. And he brings him back to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church. And here's the key word. They taught the word. And a great many people in Antioch and the disciples were first called Christians. So the third thing that we see here is that if we want to change the world and change ourselves, we have to teach and know the Word of God. Now, backstory on Paul. Paul is sent to Tarsus because he needs protection. He was converted, and there's an uproar from the Jews in Jerusalem. And so he stayed there for years before Barnabas comes to get him. And Barnabas is smart because he can't handle the work alone, and I, I can understand that. He goes into the church, and he looks around, and he goes, Whoa. I need some assistance. But why the teaching of the word? Why is it so important? Number one, knowing the word marks a healthy ministry and a healthy servant of God. Barnabas and Paul's ministry in Antioch was marked by their teaching. Believers are regularly and methodically instructed on their new faith. Does this mark you and does this mark our church? If somebody were to come up and ask me what defines Community Gospel Church, it is always the teaching of the Word of God so that the people can be clear on what the message is and know how to live it out in their everyday life. That's my goal and desire for me as a pastor to you as the people. And us collectively as a congregation, because I'm a member here just like you are, that the Word of God is faithfully taught, articulated, and clear. Why? 2 Timothy because all Scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for you and for me for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. If Barnabas is a friend that you need but you don't want, the Word of God is a need that you definitely want. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If I invade the culture, it is not with my opinion. I invade the culture with what I know to be true from God's Word. So if I'm going to make any difference or impact in this world, it has to come from what I know in the Word, not from my opinion that I give to man. I don't care about your opinion. 
I care about what God's word says. And Paul and Barnabas teach the word. And it marks them, if you look at verse 26, as Christians. Antioch is going to be a mix of Greek and Aramaic-speaking Jews and Gentiles. Now, Christians here means Christ ones. The ending, in, means belonging to the party of Jesus. There's debate on who started it. Not that the believers would do it, because they had other terms for themselves. They were called followers of the way. They were called uh, believers. Not Jews. They wouldn't do that because they wouldn't want the Messiah, Christos, associated with this new movement. So we wonder where they got it from. But regardless of where they got it, they were called it because of the word that they had internally. And so what we see here that takes place is what they received and what they knew is what they were coined with. What would people call you? What do people call me? One of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It's easy to laugh at men's ideas and ideals. It's easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. But we have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time, a word of praise and thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Blessed is the woman who speaks such a word to a culture that needs it the most from the beloved word of God. So I have to know his word. A lot of you have told me, Jordan, I started Read Scripture, which is a great reading plan. We sent an email on that just a little bit ago, and, and a lot of you have clinged to it. Keep going. Keep going. We prayed this morning that our body would be a body that is defined by the Word of God. How can I know when cancer hits, or mom and dad are struggling with health, or I'm struggling with health, or my marriage is falling apart, or my kids are falling apart, or my job is falling apart, or when the world is just whirling around me, where does my help and strength come from? My strength comes from the Lord and His Word. If you don't know it, you get in it. It comes from here. It's the Word. 27. <clears throat> Now in these days, the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and this take place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined uh, everyone, including according to his abilities or gifts, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders of the hand of Barnabas. So we realize what's happening here is they're giving gifts. Now, here's the culmination of the text. And let me give you six things. If you want to write them down, you can. But the, the fourth thing that we see here on changing the world is being used by God. How am I used by God? I'm going to give these to you real fast because I want us to take communion together. Number one, if I want to be used by God, I have to be in the world and not of it, which means I need to be unstained by our culture. I want to be unstained by our culture. God, my prayer for 2019 is that I would be in the world, but not of it, and I would be unstained by culture, but I would radically be able to transform it by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Antioch, the believers were first called Christians, and they bore, bore the name of the Savior. They're unstained by culture, identified by Christ. Number two, in 2019, and here in the text, we realized that they wanted to be stretched. You see struggle here, rejection here, criticism here, and death. But the situations and circumstances that the believers found themselves in, they welcomed them. God, use me, stretch me in 2019. That's my desire. Don't make the road easy. Make it worth walking on. Unstained by culture, stretched. Third thing I see, verse 21, 23, and 26. Obedient. Barnabas, obedient in encouraging the believers. Saul, obedient in encouraging the believers. Both of them, a solid attachment to Christ and Christ alone. It says over and over again in the text, those who believed turned to the Lord. 
obedience, 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 obedience. The first thing on our minds in the morning should be, God, make me obedient to your word and to your truth. Use me. God uses the obedient. Unstained by culture, stretched, obedience. Four, bold in our witness. The church spoke, told, preached, and people believed. Do you say, but the word of God says, but that's not what the Bible says. Do those words come out of your mouth and my mouth and our mouth collectively as a church? But what does the Bible say? I know what you think. I know what you believe. But what does God's word say? If God's going to use me, I have to be used first by his word. Unstained by culture, stretched, obedience, bold in a witness, open my mouth. Five, liberal in giving. The Antioch church gave, and here we see it in the very last part of the text, unselfish, other-centered, giving-oriented to a radically different congregation and culturally. They are giving monetarily. 2019, we're going to ask people to give to some of the physical resources that we need at the church or desire at the church. To give physically with time. To give sacrificially with their gifts. It identifies them as being used by God. Unstained by culture, stretched, obedience, bold in witness, liberal in giving, fifth, or sixth one, equipped all by God's word. The church was taught, classes are in session, courses were laid out, study happened, memorization came. And they became a sending place because it was a studying place. This is a picture of an equipped church and equipped people willing to be used by God. How do I change the world? Invade culture, be a Barnabas, know the word, and be willing to be used by God. And here we see the chapter end with a healthy up-and-coming Gentile church with two pastors, Barnabas and Saul. They have giving saints in the congregation with spiritual character used mightily by God to spread the gospel. The church had a nod to the past, but they had a vision for the future. They were aggressive. And this is what we are to be called as a church, to reach the lost for Christ. I hope that the same things are said about us in 2019 that were said about the church in Acts 11. I pray that the same things that were said about the people in this congregation are the same things that are said about you. That preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and teaching his word, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Let's pray for that this morning. Heavenly Father, we love your word because it's truth. And we love how the Gentiles received the message of the gospel because of the Jews' disobedience. We're grafted in, as the Bible tells us, to the family of God. Amazing. But we don't just sit there. You call us to go. There's work to be done. There's a culture to invade. You want us to be encouragers. To speak the truth with smiles on our face. To show the world that love is not a condemnation. Love is a salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. We need to know this truth, God. And as we look at 2019 square in the face, we realize that we need to make decisions every single morning when we wake up. To spend time with you before we take time with the world. You need to be the first thing that we think about. You need to be the first thing that we talk to. You need to be the first thing that we meditate on. You need to be the one that we desire to be used for. As the potter throws the clay down and starts to mold and shape to pot, 
So we ask the same things for us in 2019. That you would mold us and shape us and form us to the image of Christ so much so that people would look at us in the community as individuals but also as a church and say they are Christians. They look like Christ. They would look at us and they would say there's something different about these people. They go through trials and tribulations and yet they still have joy. They go through hardship and loss and death, but they have peace. How do they do these things? It is only through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God. We ask very specifically this morning that you would stir in us a passion for you. Put us very pointedly in the places that you want us so that we can shine as lights in dark places. May we run to those places. May we have the ability to see you and your hand move in all of these areas so that we can grow spiritually, but also numerically as well. Those that are far from you would come to know you and that we would be edified and grow as too as well. God, we love you. I love you. I thank you that you know and that you care and that you're working for the good of those who love you as well. We believe in the name of Jesus Christ, a risen Savior. It is in your power that we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.